this is my name. I have a condensed name here. My full name would be available for you uh, over a period of time because I'll be switching between different screens, showing you some interesting stuff on the internet and things like that. So ultimately, you'll come to know about my complete name. People murder my name to the core. They cannot pronounce my name properly because my name is quite typical. So that is the reason why I put that condensed name here. You can call me Kumar, by the way. And here is my education. I'm a computer science graduate from JNTU. I've done my one-year program from Indian School of Business. Here are the bunch of certifications that I possess. I'm a project management professional. I have done my Agile Certified Practitioner. And then I've done my risk management professional certification. I'm a certified scrum master. I'm Lean Six Sigma Green Belt, Black Belt, and Master Black Belt from Arabic USA. I've done my ITIL. I'm Agile Foundation certified, foundation and practitioner certified from APMG UK. And that is my passion here, data scientist. That's my profession. And to a great extent, my passion as well. And I do a lot of research in analytic space. And here is my passion for cricket and bodybuilding. So the analytics research project that I'm working upon is video analytics. There was a person who has gone on a rampage killing innocent small kids in Connecticut in US. It seems that supposedly he has posted six of his videos even before he went on a shooting rampage there. First video that he has posted was about his parents getting separated when he was still a kid. So he suffered a lot as a kid. The second video that he has posted on YouTube was speaking about how teachers in the school have discriminated him, assuming that he was mentally challenged, he was a different character and things like that. And the third video that he has posted has told that his frustration has only built over the period of years because his own brother has deserted him and he wasn't playing with him and things like that. The fourth video that he has posted was that he wanted to purchase a gun. Fifth video that he has posted said that he has actually purchased a gun and he wants to wipe out the children's life because he could not live a decent childhood there. And the last video that he has posted two hours before that incident was, I'm going to go kill children in that particular school. Two hours of time is what people had to take corrective action, right? So how good is analytics if we cannot save the lives of innocent human beings, right? Children, they haven't even seen the world fully, right? So can we analyze the YouTube videos and you know the amount of data that is getting posted, uploaded on YouTube on a daily basis? Can I stay on top of that? Can I analyze those videos? Can I bring out some inferences? and say that, hey, these are the people who might be potentially facing some kind of challenges, mental challenges, right? So can you send them to some kind of a psychiatrist even before a damage happens? Is there any person showing signs of suicidal tendencies? Is there any person who is showing terrorist activities, uh, those kind of tendencies and things like that? That is a research project that I'm working on, right? Thought, food for thought. How do we analyze terabytes and right uh, zettabytes of data on a daily basis? If it's a text document, probably I can quickly analyze, build a prediction model on top of that, do all sorts of things. How do I analyze videos? Videos are broken down into images, into different frames, and then you start analyzing that. So that's a project that I'm working on currently. I'm very interested in learning newer things in analytic space. All right, that is all about my boring profile. I don't uh, intend to bore you any further. Let me get started. So Amar, uh, I have approximately 13 years of experience, 13 plus years of experience. And I'm into this analytics. I would say not into big data and uh, that kind of analytics, but I was into Six Sigma consulting. I was building a lot of prediction models and things like that. Uh, I would say since eight years or so. Welcome to this session on advanced predictive modeling using R. This module one is going to discuss about basic statistics in R. Even before that, why do you need to get into business analytics? And why become a data scientist, right? Why now? Why did this 
data analytics as a profession caught the attention of the world now. Was it not existent before? Right? So here are the answers to that. So Harvard Business Review has come up with this interesting article which says data scientists would be the sexiest job of the 21st century. Harvard Business School is regarded as the best, arguably the best B school because there are a few others competing with that. So data scientist is the sexiest job of the 21st century. Along with that, they have made an alarming statement which says shortage of data scientists is becoming, se is becoming a serious constraint in some sectors. I would say in all the sectors. All right? And what is this shortage going to be? Let me show you that. Mm -mm. Skill shortage, right? Yeah, here. They Look at that. This is an interesting article which was published by McKinsey. United States alone is going to face a shortage of 140,000 to 190,000 people with analytics expertise and 1.5 million managers. That is a shortage with the, which United States alone is looking at. This shortage is only going to increase in leaps and bounds. So here is an opportunity for you all to grab this with both your hands. And analytics is fairly niche now and it's naive also because I know for a fact that most of the companies have just started the proposal phase started responding to the proposals to the client. They have just started doing the prototypes. I'm speaking about the super notch companies, right? Tier one companies. And it's only going to increase now. The demand and the rigor is only going to increase. Why now was it not existent before? It was existent before, but the data on which people have started analyzing was limited because of less internet penetration because of less exposure towards social media and because of high prices of internet, right? Now the internet cost is extremely small, right? The cost of purchasing your memory, cost of purchasing your storage devices has come down drastically. Exposure towards internet has increased to a great extent that has suddenly brought about, brought about a surge in the data, increase in the data that is getting generated. And with this increase of ge data getting generated comes an additional role or additional, you know, profile which is called as data scientist. Now this data scientist is expected to analyze all the data and bring about some business inferences out of that. All this is fine, data scientist is a sexiest job, McKinsey is predicting that there would be some shortage. So what? What is a salary going to be like, right? So let me show you this. Salaries of chief data scientists with over 10 years of experience in mathematics and statistics are regularly touching one crore mark. How cool is that? Paytm, which is mobile commerce player, is hiring a team of eight data scientists in Canada, paying on an average $250,000. When did we hear people drawing these kind of crazy salaries? People who have already been to US, worked there for a few years. Tell me, for a person who gets 10 years of experience, is getting $100,000. Isn't that a big deal? 100K is a big deal, right? For a person having 10 years of experience, and think about $250,000. When would you reach that mark? Some crazy salaries are there for your grab there. Right. Touching 50 lakhs on an average annually in India, I'm speaking about in India, is not a big deal now for a person who has the stuff, who has the right attitude, who has analytical skills, right? who knows the concepts well. This is the kind of salaries that we are looking at. right? And there is one more thing. Now, is this a bubble waiting to be burst or is this something true? Right? For that, there is second article published by Economic Times, 
So the 11 hottest job profiles that will only scale up in 2015. I would say until 2020. Until 2020, you would see these kind of crazy salaries being drawn. This kind of demand would exist at least till 2020, according to various research papers and all that, right? Look at that. Depending on the scale of the business, the lead salary can vary from 80 lakh to 1.5 crore, and mid managers are paid upward of rupees 50 lakh. Indian rupee, right? Indian rupees. This is a huge salary that we are looking at, right? And if you still do not believe me, uh, let me go to Google Trends and show you something even more interesting here. Let us type data scientist and see what is the demand looking like. Look at that. Until 2009, there wasn't a profession called data scientist. In 2011, as and how the data got generated to a great extent, in 2013 it was exponential and in 2014 and 15, we are living in 2015 and we know kind of influence that social media is having on us, right? The kind of influence that WhatsApp is having on us, Viber and the mobile applications. Right, we keep chatting with the friends, we keep looking into the social media, we keep looking into the reviews, we keep writing reviews, we keep watching videos on YouTube, we keep uploading videos on YouTube, right? We keep uploading our images on Pinterest and things like that. So if you're doing so many things, why would there not be any demand for data scientists? What will you do with the data which is getting generated? Are you going to sit on the pile of the data? No, we need to take some business inferences. We need to draw some business inferences, right? Hence, this profession is fast catching up there. Now, you might ask me another thing. Why should I learn R? Why should I not learn SAS? SAS, if you see, it's steadily dipping there, the demand for that. If I forecast, it's going to further dip. All right, let me compare IBM SPSS with that. Why shouldn't I learn SPSS? Why should I learn R? There you go. SPSS is even more pathetic. This is the kind of demand, right? Google searches and based on that. If I forecast and see, SPSS is gonna further dip there. It's not going to increase. Let us compare this with R and see what is happening to R. Look at that. Is there any comparison at all whatsoever? Hence you're learning R. And few other research says that, so R has 47% of the market share based on KD nudgets. That's a research organization. It says that R has 47% of the market share as compared to SAS, which has only 12% of market share. Let us look into this. Why is R becoming even more important? There is something called as Revolution Analytics, which was recently acquired by Microsoft. Revolution Analytics, right, was earlier working on R code to build enterprise solutions. So that, you know, for SAS, if you have uh, if you're using SAS and if you get any error, you can raise a ticket or raise a request with SAS team and have them solve that. So you have someone to get hold of, right? And you have SLAs and all that, uh, you know, agreed upon. However, when it comes to R, R is open source, hence you cannot get hold of anyone's caller if you have any issue, if it's not getting fixed, right? That is the reason why we have a Revolution Analytics, right? Revolution Analytics is working on R to build enterprise solutions. Now you have someone to go to, to have your issues fixed. And how many people are using R? Why is R so much in demand? More than 2 million R developers around the world. So how many people might be developing your SaaS or SPSS? How many people might be building on that, trying to build, uh, trying to, you know, improve the current features and things like that. I'm not speaking about the complete employee strength of SaaS or IBM, right? I'm speaking about the core team or the number of people who will be working on its development. It will be hardly 1,000, 2,000, maybe in research and development. But here, there are 2 million users across the world and everyone is contributing towards the development of R. Any competition on Kaggle, people use R. Any university research, mostly they use R. So, you know, you have a lot of people, professors, universities, research organizations using R just for the reason that it's free, of course. Now, if all of those people are developing R, then how can a company like SAS or IBM even try to compete with them, right? 
So that is why R is fast catching the attention of everyone. How oh, that's all about the good things about R. I'll take a question and quickly tell you about the bad thing about R. Sometimes data science, Amar has this question, sometimes data science is too good to be true. It does not guarantee actionable insights after spending months and dollars. What can be done in many such situations? So Amar, I would say this statement was true probably few years back, right? Now think about or give me an example of any case study which uh, from using which you cannot draw actionable insights. Yeah, I agree that it's going to be difficult. It's not going to be a cakewalk at all. It's not going to be walk in the park. However, people are building the models, prediction models, which are 95% accurate, 96% accurate. If you go to Kaggle and see the competition, right, if you compete with or compete on any of the case study, you'll appreciate the fact that nowadays the accuracy of your models has increased like crazy. Why? Because of the advent of new algorithms, use of ensemble models. Ensemble models means a usage of multiple models, usage of multiple algorithms, usage of multiple techniques to arrive at a business decision or to build a model, right? So I know for a fact that your federal government there in US and a few of your government agencies are already doing a lot of analytics since long. This video analytics is fairly new for corporate world, but it's an old concept for your intelligence agencies there. Looking into your audio modulation, audio files, hearing to that, and uh, looking into the, you know, the pitch, is your voice trembling and things like that, people can easily find out whether there is any wrong thing going on somewhere, right? And uh, I would say there is no end because now people are coming with artificial intelligence and data mining and your machine learning concepts. If I find time, I'm going to show you that article wherein America is trying to come up with uh, artificial intelligence in using all of its warfare equipment. Earlier they were stationing, you know, the soldiers in various uh, war prone countries. Now they wish to send robots there. We have been seeing all these things in our movies, right? James Bond, 007 and all that. All that is becoming true now. Right, so still it's difficult. I'm not saying that it's easy. I'm saying that it is difficult. However, nothing is impossible now and drawing actionable insights is pretty easy. I'll show you a few of the case studies as in how we progress, right? Probably on a, a weekly basis, I'll show you one interesting case study. Yeah, so just bear until then, Amar. Hope I have at least to some extent answered your question because that's a very subjective question, right? It's very subjective. You might have a different belief. I might have a different belief. Just because I'm in research, right, I'm exp uh, exposing a few of my thoughts to you. All right. Welcome to this module one. Without wasting a lot of time, let us get started now. So here we have, uh, this is a live online class. So obviously, the thing that I'm speaking is not a recorded version. Uh, Satya, there is no defined certification on R as such because it's an open source. People have not come up with any certification to R. And you know what? There is also no certification on your analytic stuff as of now. Different bodies are coming up with different certification, but there is no one well-established certification body because analytics is into research still. Uh, as Amar was saying, it's not something which is very mature, which will help you bring about actionable insights quickly and easily, right? It's going to take some time similar to your Java and things, right? To get to that level of maturity, it's going to take uh, going to take another six, seven years or so. Right? So we have to wait until then. But most of the universities are providing certifications pertaining to their university. Not sure what kind of value it carries in the market. Yeah, they're providing empathy, but uh, what kind of value that carries, we don't know. It's coming from universities, right? So the professors there are also working on a lot of research. So based on that research, based on the maturity at this point of time, you can go with all those. All right. If you miss any of the session, please do not worry. 
you'll have the class recordings on LMS. It'll be for your lifetime. Probably you can hand it over even to your kids when they grow up, right? Uh, so recordings are for your lifetime there on LMS. Do not worry if you miss out on anything. If you have any questions which is out of the scope of the topics which are being discussed, I request you to drop an email to support at eureka.co and uh, one of the trainer or I would get back to you on that. You'll have assignments, you'll have a final project work. Post completing the project work, you'll get a certificate. So this is your LMS. You need to log into your LMS if you haven't done so until now. Uh, let me quickly show that. This is your LMS, right? You need to go to courses, my courses, and you'll see the list of courses assigned to you on your name. Uh, these are three which are assigned to me because I also take this session on mastering data analytics with R. And we have, I also take session on Tableau. So if you click on advanced uh, predictive modeling in R, you'll be able to see the course content, the exercise files and all that. So here we have basic statistics in R. You have the presentation here. You cannot unfortunately download that and take a print out of that, but you can view it online. And when you go to hands-on, you'll be able to download the R code, which is going to be used in this class. And uh, along with that, you'll also be able to download the data sets on which we are going to work upon. Third slide, right? That is all about that. And you right? Yeah. Right, right, so we have 10 modules, right? The last module would be a project, and we'll be using all these concepts which we have learned over a period of time, right? So we'll be learning a lot about statistics. We'll be learning about uh, forecasting techniques and survival analysis, which is advanced analytics by all means, right? And then we'll be doing the project. So do not worry, once we get into each and every module, we, we are going to do a deep dive on, around that. So here we are going to learn the basic statistics which are used in R. We're going to understand the hypothesis analysis. We're going to analyze what are all these concepts, correlation, covariance, matrix, and basic charts. Without wasting much time, let us get started with the data set which is called as MBA.CSV. So on LMS, this data set is also uploaded, so you can download that. You'll have the serial numbers, you'll have the work experience of the students along with the GMAT scores of the various students. Now, I'm going to R. So once you install your R, on top of that, you can install R Studio. Install R, and on top of that, install R Studio. R Studio is a thing which you're seeing here. It's given your name, R Studio, which is graphical user interface, GUI-based thing, and uh, it's easy to navigate basically using this, right? So you'll have to install R, and then on top of that, install R Studio. There are two books which I normally read. I would suggest you to go with uh, Regression Analysis by Example by Samprit Chatterjee and Ali Eshadi, right? Regression Analysis by Example. And that's an amazing book. That's the best book uh, I've read until now. It's very explained in very simple terms. Yeah, if you want to look into your reg regression part, if you want to learn the basics of that, then there is another book which is called as Business Statistics. And uh, you have this eighth edition which is called as, uh, just type McGraw, McGraw has that, McGraw Hill. And uh, it's called as, I believe, Complete Business Statistics. Yeah, so there we have, there we go. So you can probably read into these two books to gain, you know, good exposure on statistics and things like that. I have a small presentation, Amar. It's not complete yet, which I'm preparing, which is going to explain you about statistics, data mining, forecasting, text analytics, and all sorts of different spaces, right? Retail analytics, customer analytics, and all that. So it might take two weeks or so for me to complete that. Before the end of this complete six weeks, right, I'm going to share that with you. A quick nutshell, which will help you gain experience or come to know about the basics what are the various things which are going on, right? So, you know, using R, I'm assuming you all have installed R. If you all have installed R, I would request you to open your R Studio. Have you all installed R and R Studio? You can probably replicate the commands along with me so that if you have any specific doubts, you can ask me and get it clarified. Yeah, perfect. So if any one of you have not installed R, I would request you to install R and also install R Studio on top of that. All right. If you want to read, 
a CSV file into R, you can simply click on import data set, go to text file, and browse for your case study there, which is MBE, right? And simply click on OK, open there. Here, even before you upload, you'll be able to see how the data frame is going to look like. You have a serial number, you have the work experience and the GMAT score of the respective individual or student there. If you say heading is no, then the heading is not going to appear. If you say heading is yes, then the first row would become, become your heading there. And just click on input. There you have. If you see here in the global environment space, you see that there are 773 observations of three variables. What are the three variables here? You have serial number, work experience, and GMAT. These are the three variables. And you have 773 rules. So you have 773 students, and the details of all 773 students is provided. Yep, is this clear on how to load? Is that clear, friends? So even before we discuss about this particular slide, I first want to jump in. I want to explain about mean, standard deviation, variance, and things like that, and then we are going to come back. All right, Ganpati, here we go. Here is R. Click on Import Dataset and From Text File. Click on that, browse your particular file, and then first of all, let us try and understand what is mean. Any manager, any client, you know, their first statement would be, on an average, what is happening, right? On an average, what is my sales? On an average, how many people are leaving our organization? On an average, how many customers are moving on to our competitors? On an average, how many people are defaulting the loan? So that would be the first obvious question, right? That is mean, average or mean, mean the same, right? So can one of you all quickly calculate the mean for this data set and tell me what is the mean going to be for this? See, I'll be explaining about the finer nuances to you all, so just bear with me. And you are going to appreciate Okay, can someone say what is the mean of this? How do you calculate the mean? You add all these numbers and divide by the total count. So if I add all these numbers, it will be what, 15? 15, and you are going to divide it by, how many numbers are there? Five numbers. 15 by five is what? Three. Three is the mean for this data set. I'm going to create another data set, and the four numbers are going to look alike. So one, I'll take two, I'll take three here, I'll take four here. I'm going to change only one number. I'm going to change five to 700. What is the total count here? Going to be 710 divided by five because there are five numbers. It's going to be what, 142 if I'm not mistaken, 142, yeah. So look at the difference in the mean. Three here and 142 here. How can there be so much of difference just because of one number? So here your number 700 is an extremely high value. Just one number is different out of these five. And this one number is sufficient to impact your mean in a big way. Hence, mean is not a good representation if you have these kind of outliers. Hence, mean is not a good representation. So what do I look into? If I cannot look into mean, then what is the value that I need to actually look into? Can someone say? Mean is impacted by your outliers, so what value should I look into? Median. There you go, you guys are right, median, right? So what is the median for this first data set? Right, it's gonna be three. What is the median for the second data set? Three. So, median is going to remain the same despite your outliers, median is not going to get influenced by your outliers. All right. So tell me what is the median for this data set? What is the median for this data set? You're telling that median is the middlemost number. I agree with you all. So what is the median for this data set here? Ah, if you have even data set, you need to take the middle two numbers and take average of that. So it'll be 2.5. 2.5 is your median. What is the median for this? Four, six, two, three, one, six, eight. What is the median for this data set? 
Absolutely, absolutely, you got it right, Satya. So what we do is, if the data set is in this order, you are going to first sort it. One, two, three, four, six, six, eight. Uh, this is the middle number, so four is going to be your median, right? Fine. There is another measure of central tendency, right? That is called as mode. When do you guys use mode? When do we use mode? Anyone? There are three measures of central tendency, mean, median, and mode, right? You know what, when do we use mean, when do we use median now, right? If there are outliers, you go with median. If there are no outliers, mean is a good indication, right? Um, when do you go with mode? All right. So when do we use mode? Yeah, great. So we use mode when we have qualitative or categorical variables. Suppose I have laptops, defects or defectives or whatever be it, right? I cannot take an average, right? Simply an average. Say I have uh, three laptops. I have laptop one, laptop two, and laptop three. Can I take mean of this? Is it going to make sense? How can I divide the number of laptops? Mm -hmm. Doesn't make sense, right? Uh, suppose I add one more laptop. Say there is laptop four, things like that. So can I take average of that or median? Doesn't really make sense, right? So instead, what do you do? You look into mode. Mode is used when you have qualitative variables, basically, right? And um, can someone say what is the mode of this data set? What is the mode of this? One. Why is that so? This number one is repeated maximum number of times, hence it is called as mode. The number which repeats itself maximum number of times. This is called as unimodal because I have only one mode, right? It's called as unimodal and the graph is going to look like that with one peak, right? Now, uh, can someone say what is the mode of this data set? What is the mode of this data set? One and two, right? There are two modes here. Yeah. So if you have two modes, it is called as bimodal. You'll have two peaks here. And on similar lines, you can also have multimodal, right? That's absolutely fine. So this is your first moment business decision, which is your measure of central tendency. The second question, which, you know, people or management or leadership might ask is, is there any variance in our sales? You're giving me on an average what is the sales happening over one year, over the period of one year. But do you see any variance also? Such as in one month the sales have increased, in another month sales have decreased. Is there a major difference between different sales happening different months? Or is it fairly constant? That would be the second business decision which people would ask you, right? So there comes your measures of dispersion. So one uh, thing is your variance. First, let us look into variance, right? I'll take a simple data set. Say you have one, two, three. How do I look into variance of a data set? Hope you all understand the basics of variance and all that. I'm not going to get into that minute detail there. So I have three numbers. First, I take the average of this. It'll be two. Average would be two. X bar, mu, and all population sample. I'm assuming you guys know that. All right. Now, if I want to calculate variance, this is how I would do that. It's summation of i equal to 1 till n x bar uh, x i minus x bar whole square divided by n minus 1 for mean, uh, for sample, sorry, sample. Okay, now let us do that. Say this is $1, this is $2, and this is $3. So the average is $2. Now if I were to calculate right this, I would say it's $1 minus $2 whole square plus $1, uh, sorry, $2, here second number, minus the mean, which is $2 whole square, plus uh, xi, which is $3, minus the mean, which is $2 whole square, divided by n minus 1 is your uh, 2. So when I do this calculation, right, what, what will happen here? It will be $1 square plus 
two dollar square will be four dollar square plus you'll have one dollar square if you take the average of this it will be uh, two dollar square if I say that the variation in the process is two dollar square if I ask you to calculate the variation in the salaries of your company you come back to me and say hey the variance is dollar square thousand dollar square or ten thousand dollar square is this dollar square making any sense for you you know for a fact that we are squaring that's the formula for a variance and if we square obviously the units are also getting are going to get squared if I ask you what is the variance in your weights if one of you is going to come back and say hey it's 10 pound square or 10 kg square this pound square or kg square is not really making sense for me right is it making sense for you all if I, if you ask me uh, on what is the average or what is the variance in our ages or in our years of experience if I say hey the variance in our years of experience is five years square is this making any sense for you all if my units get squared is it going to make any sense for you all no it is absolutely not going to make any sense for you all so what do you do you take a square root of this you take a square root of this you take a square root of that right let me erase everything let me say uh, let me go with the same example say the variance in the salaries of the employees in your company is ten thousand dollars square if I take a square root of that I get hundred dollars now hundred dollar is making sense for me because the unit is dollar if it's dollar square height square weight square and things like that it's not going to make sense for me so hence variance on its own is not going to give you meaningful information so you need to take square root of variance and the square root of variance is called a standard deviation why do we take square root of variance because we want to get the original units which we were using is this clear friends is this clear on what is the difference between variance and standard deviation all right so guys if any one of you all have any doubts please speak up uh, because if you do not understand the basics right you might lose out on key things uh, because uh, until unless you calculate variance right you'll not be able to calculate the standard deviation it's anyways the square root of variance only or you you might say me that hey why don't we use standard deviation instead of variance in your advanced statistical concepts right standard deviation doesn't have any meaning there it's variance always so in your advanced statistics you'll come to understand that okay now we have another measure which is called as range range is equal to maximum value minus minimum value maximum minus minimum value right and uh, that is also a measure of central tendency so I'm sure you guys are clear with this now think about this think about this I have weight gained and I know for a fact that weight gained is dependent on calories consumed weight gain is equal to calories consumed you can equate this with an equation which says y is equal to function of inputs or any output that you want to achieve is dependent on inputs if you want a good a good job in your analytics space then you need to put in a lot of effort so any output that you want is dependent on function of inputs if you want to be unhappy if that is the outcome that you want to achieve then probably you can go get married so these are all the outputs that you want to achieve any output that you want to achieve is dependent on few inputs so think about this weight gained is equal to calories consumed and if you want to see whether there is really a relationship between weight gain and calories consumed then the first step that I need to look into is plot those two on y-axis and x-axis right so y-axis is your weight gained x-axis is your calories consumed if we start plotting these two on a graph I look colorful I, I like colorful graphs so okay. here is my data point as and how calories are consumed is increasing your weight gain is also increasing as you this says that there is a positive correlation between these two variables 
all right and another side if you have a y and x axis they're two different variables if the relationship is in this way then you say that the relationship between y and x is a negative correlation there is a negative correlation between these two if it's in upward direction then you say there is a positive correlation between these two variables x and y all right now okay well, let me put this let me draw two charts there x and y axis all the data points are like this and I draw a line like that here all the data points are uh, slightly dispersed there there's a relationship like that in which of these graphs you feel that the relationship between y and x is strong first graph everyone agree with that the closer the data points are to this straight line more is the strength of the relationship between the two variables x and y more far away are these data points from each other less is the strength of the relationship yeah also outliers are low and things like that right now can you exactly quantify on what is the strength of the relationship between x and y here and here I want the exact numerical value using which I can quantify the strength now you are qualitative right you are qualitatively looking into this diagram and saying that hey relationship is strong in the first diagram because all the data points are closer to each other whereas in the second example data points are slightly dispersed hence the relationship is slightly weak right now can someone quantify I don't want a qualitative statement I want a quantitative representation uh, no Satya I'm, I'm speaking about correlation I'm speaking about correlation not regression there anyone anyone at all let's see there's someone with standard error uh, not exactly Amar anyone Ganpati, Vishal, Sam. Mm. Yep, Sam. You're right on that. What is a small r called as? What is a small r called as? Correlation coefficient, right? You're right on that. So we have correlation coefficient. We can look into either that or we can look into covariance. There are two measures, not one measure, there are two measures covariance and correlation so what happens when you use your covariance right covariance does not tell us much about the strength of the relationship because covariance is impacted by your units if I change the units for example in our MBA file there was work experience in months if I change that months to years that means if I just change the unit nothing else I change only the unit then the covariance values are going to look different how do I get rid of that to avoid this disadvantage of covariance right we standardize the data or normalize the data right how do we standardize or normalize the data simple right what am I doing here I have the work experience if I go to the previous slide here the work experience which is given is in months it's in months right so if I just change the unit I'll not change any of the values here I'll just change the unit from probably months to weeks now if I change this unit to weeks from months it is going to change the values of your covariance the values will get impacted here I do not want my values to be impacted just because 
uh, someone is accidentally changing the unit to wrong unit and things like that. I do not want the correlation values to be impacted. So what do I do there? I probably do standardization or normalization. How do you standardize or normalize? Simple. It's x bar, oh, sorry, x minus mu divided by standard deviation. This is a simple formula. x minus mu by standard deviation. This is how you standardize, right? When, when I say standardize or normalize, I'm telling that I'm making this value of your work experience unitless. I don't want any units associated with that. I'm going to calculate some value, some value here, which doesn't have any unit. I'm calculating the GMAT score, which has no unit absolutely. How am I ensuring that there is no unit? By using that formula which I have just shown you on the screen, which is z is equal to x minus mu by standard deviation. Yeah, clear friends? So when I do that, right, it's nothing but I'm doing a correlation. So your correlation is better measure, correlation coefficient, to look into the relationship between two variables. And covariance is not a good measure. Why? Because covariance is impacted by your outliers. Uh, sorry, not outliers. My bad. What am I thinking? Covariance is impacted by the units. But correlation does not have any units. Even if you change the units from kilograms to pounds or from centimeters to millimeters, whatever be it, it's not going to impact your final outcome. You can do a quick experiment on the data set, right? You can do that and you'll find it for your own. All right, so let us run these commands and try to understand what's going around, uh, going around here. Uh, so, oh, let me go there and let me open the R code. Uh, yep, there we go. So let us first standardize your work experience. If I just run that command, how do we run this command? Either I click on this run option there, or I press Control Enter or Control R on Windows. Command Enter, I believe, in Mac, if you're using a MacBook there. So if I run that command, I'm going to get this. So each value that is being generated here is nothing but I'm taking the mean of all 773 observations. Right? What am I doing here? I'm taking average of all this work experience, right? And I'm subtracting each value 21 for example, 21, right, minus whatever mean you calculate divided by standard deviation, you'll get this value. So on and so forth, all the values are getting generated. Why are we doing that? Because I don't want my final measurements to be impacted by the units. If this is months or if this is years or weeks or whatever beat, I don't want my final outcome to be impacted, right? Hence, I'm taking this, or I'm doing this, standardization, right? Now, if you want to know what does the center equal to true means, what does scale equal to true means, what is the syntax all about, what does your head mean? Head means the header information. Header doesn't mean only the column name. It means even if you have 773 observations, this head option, head command, is going to show you the first six. So, if I simply use, show me the head of MBA. It's going to show me the first six rows 
of this data set. Just to help me get a feel on what are the various columns available, how are the values looking like and things like that. And if I do a tail of MBA there, I get to see the bottom six entries of this file called MBA, right? the bottom six here. And if you want to know more about this scale option, right, it's just question mark and scale. Here you see all that. Here is the syntax for scale. X comma center equal to true and scale equal to true. And there's a detailed description on when you use center and when, we use, when you use scale, right? If center is true, then the centering is done by subtracting the column mean of X from the corresponding columns. You subtract the column mean, you take the average, you subtract that from the corresponding columns. That's called as centering. I'm centering something, right? What does scale equal is true mean? Scale is true, then scaling is done by dividing columns by the standard deviations if the center is true. And you take the or otherwise you take the uh, root mean square otherwise, right? Root mean square, how do you calculate that? You calculate using this. So all this, do I need to know? Probably if you're building algorithms and things like that, you need to know. Otherwise, just understand here that this is the syntax. You just need to remember the syntax, okay? Now, what is this command doing here? MBA dollar work experience. That means from this MBA file, I'm accessing the column called work experience. That is what this MBA dollar means. And what is the scale? Here you have scale is a generic function whose default method centers and or scales the columns of the numeric matrix. Do we need to understand each and everything about this code? Each and every element of the code? Maybe may not be depending on your comfort level. But I would request you to, you know, just understand what does head mean here? Uh, what are we doing by using this command called MBA dollar? That means from MBA file, I'm calling a specific column. What does MBA dollar GMAT mean? From this MBA file, I'm calling a specific column called GMAT there. That is your head information, right? Now for covariance, I have this command which says covariance of MBA. How do you run this command? Simply press control enter. You see the covariance values. Now we know for a fact that if I'm going to change the units of work experience or GMAT, my covariance values are also going to change. I do not want it to happen that way. Whatever units I use, I want the same values to appear. So for that, there is an enhancement which is called as correlation coefficient. If I run that command, you see these values, right? So wherever you see a negative, that means there is a negative correlation. All the values are negative, so all the values have negative correlation. Work experience and GMAT has negative correlation and things like that. And it's gonna look symmetrical here in your correlation, right? All these ones, that is serial number and serial number, work experience and work experience here, GMAT and GMAT. The correlation between the same variable with itself would always be one. And you have the various other correlation values. So this correlation is going to tell you on whether there is a strong correlation between two variables, yes or no? Clear, friends? Clear at least until correlation and covariance? Please respond, everyone, because we will take a break now. Satya is clear, Sam is clear. Ganpati, are you clear? Amar, Vishal, Satya. Clear? Great. Yeah. Thank you so much then. Um, we will just take a break for 10 minutes or so and then come back. Sorry, I haven't given you a break after one hour because 
it was just quick introduction of each other and all that it has taken a lot of time so just take a break tea break or bio break whatever beat and come back after 10 minutes or so thank you second graphical representation which is box plot what does box plot do I'm, I'm just plotting that oh let me plot it without this horizontal let me show you what happens here. this is how your box plot is going to look like now this box plot represents 100% of your data so this line here is called as a minimum value right this line here this line bottom of this box here that is called as Q1 or quartile 1 so from here till here you'll see lower 25% of the data lower 25% of the data and this line there is called as Q3 which is called as third quartile and this third until here you'll have 75% of the data from the minimum value and this box contains middle 50% of the data middle 50% of the data and this bold line is called as median the upper line calculates the maximum value here and these dots here are called as outliers outliers this is your box plot it represents 100% of the data it will tell you where your meat lies meat meaning majority of the stuff middle 50% of the data right and where are your outliers where do you have true business potential do you need to focus on your area where there's a lot of demand and competition or do you want to select the niche area things like that now this middle 50% of the data is called as interquartile range it's called as interquartile range or IQR this region IQR it's calculated as Q3 minus Q1 now using R code I can probably change the direction of that I can color code and I can do all sorts of stuff so similar to this right horizontal is equal to true if you run that command instead of representing it vertically it's representing in a horizontal way so here you have the outliers towards the other side in the first case right here let me say horizontal is equal to true and run this command here if you see this plot so here you see that the outliers are towards the upper side and if you look into the other graph which we have generated on GMAT you see the outliers here this is Q1 uh, this is the minimum value this is Q1 until here this middle dark bull line is called as a median this part here is called as Q3 quartile 3 and this entire box contains middle 50% of the data from this Q3 until the maximum value you'll have another 25% of the data so 100% of the data can be represented using box plot and it also helps you identify the outliers in short we can also do summary of MBA what does that do it's going to calculate what is the minimum value what is the first quartile what is the median mean third quartile and maximum value right for all of your variables this is another way of exploring your data if you if I want just the mean of GMAT variable within this MBA file I run this command if I just want to know the variance of GMAT variable in the MBA file I run this command variance of that this is all the syntax mind you this is the syntax so if I want just a standard deviation I take that and you know for a fact that standard deviation is square root of your variance here now here comes something called as packages what is package package is nothing but collection of your code package is collection of the code few people in the past might have written some code and they might have felt that hey this code can be probably reused by other people if it can be reused if that can be reused then I'll make it public and I'm going to you know zip all those code all the lines of code and I'm going to give it a name some name here in this case I've given a name called moments now this moments package right 
is required for me to look into kurtosis and skewness for a data set. So here is a simple command to install the package which is called as install or packages of moments within double quotes. Do not forget that. If I run that command, look at this red sign here, red icon, it says that some operation is in progress now. If I click on that, it's going to stop the operation, but that's not my intention here. I want this to be installed. Once it is installed, uh, you can go to package here. You can also install from here, right? Any package. You click on that install here, install button there, and you'll see the pop-up. You can type in whatever package you want to install, right? Once you install, it's going to appear here, moments, right? So let me search the moments package there just to double check. Yeah, moments is there. Moments is required for me to capture skewness, kudosis, and a few other tests. Moments and, you know, something called as cumulants. I'm not sure what cumulants means anyways. If I want to explore, I can click on the package and explore on what that is all about. Okay? So once you install the package, your job is not done yet. You need to load this package. How do you load this package? You simply run this command called library of moments and your package is loaded here. Now look at this. There was no tick mark beside this before I ran this command library of moments. Now there's a tick mark. So what does that mean? Let me detach that. When I uncheck that, it's going to detach. Either I run this command or uncheck that. If I check this instead, if I put a check mark beside that, see what happens? It's going to run this command called Sorry, library of moments. The same command is getting run, executed. If I put a check mark. So this is a good part about your R Studio, which is GUI based, graphical user interface. Or I can also go to tools, click on install packages, and install the package of my choice. So there are multiple ways of installing and uh, you know loading your packages. So here is skewness. If I run this skewness. It has given me a value, right? Minus. If the skewness value is negative, if the skewness value is negative, you'll see this kind of a chart, which is skewed towards the left side. Negative means it is skewed towards your left side, right? And if it's positive, if this value is positive, right, it will be skewed towards your right side, as in this experience, work experience, right? Or you can also do that. Let me paste that here and let us look into work experience right if run that command see it's a positive value if skewness is a positive value you'll see a right tail it's negative you see a left tail and this is called a third moment business decision I'm not going to do deep dive on that uh, because you already know the long tail concept. Then comes the kurtosis. What do you mean by kurtosis? It's another way of looking into your distribution. So let me run this command. So this is a positive value, right? If kurtosis is positive, that means, right, the width is less. The width is less. That means it's thinner. If kurtosis is um, negative, that means the width is going to be wider. So if I were to draw this right, I would say if it's positive, right, it's going to look like that. If it's negative, uh, if it's negative, right, yeah, if it's negative, it's going to look like that. If it's positive, it's going to look like me. If it's negative, it's going to look like my wife, for example. Right? After marriage, you know, that is how people look like. So, yeah. That's just, with all due respect, that's just a comedy there. So, yeah, kurtosis and skewness. It's going to explain about the distribution of the data set. Yeah. Once you do that, I can do a bunch of various things, you know. I can look into histogram once again. I've run histogram here. And on top of that, I can draw a small curve. And if you look at this, it says mean and standard deviation. So any curve can be represented using mean and standard deviation. So let me run this command. Uh, sorry, why was there an error? Because 
I highlighted only this portion, right? I can only run a portion of my code or entire code. If I want to run this entire line, right, I can click anywhere in the between or towards the start or towards the end, anywhere on that line, I can click and run the command. So it has superimposed a curve on your histogram. Now this gives you a sense on what kind of distribution this is and you know for a fact that it is uh, left skewed because it's going to have negative skewness here. Right? Or I first of all want to know whether my data is normal or not. Right? Because for if the data follows normal, if the data is normal, looking all right, okay for me, if it's a normal distribution, then I follow different analysis. If the data does not follow a normal distribution, I take a different approach. Probably I will try to transform the data or do a different analysis altogether. Hence, I check normality in whether data is looking normal or not. All right, it's all okay for me kind of in layperson terms, not in statistical terms, right? So let us run this command QQ norm. QQ norm this command have performed on this GMAT variable of MBA data set. This is also called as normal QQ plot, QQ plot. If these data points, right, are somewhat closer to, if I draw a straight line and if these data points are closer to that, then I can see that this data follows normal distribution. But if the data points are far away, there are a lot of outliers here, out, a lot of outliers here, then probably I'm going to say that it's, it doesn't follow a normal distribution. And data is not normal, basically. That is what I think. But you know, visually it is difficult for me to look into this and say, because there's no straight line here. So let me draw a straight line. So I've run this command called QQ line. It's going to draw a line on this MBA dollar GMAT here. And also it's going to color the line with red color. Color is equal to red. So now there is a straight line imaginary line which we have drawn now. All these data points should be closer to this line to claim that the data follows normal distribution. Here I hardly see any data points falling on that line. Most of the data points are outside or of this line. Uh, so what do you comment about whether data is normal or not? For this, exactly a straight line and everything should fall within that might be a slightly difficult task. However, if you draw a QQ plot, mind you R is case sensitive, and if you use a small p instead of the capital P, it's not going to help you. So let me run this command also. There you go. Huh. Okay. Okay, there is one more package called extremes, right? Here, I have not installed that. And I need to install that to run this command QQ plot. Right? So let us run this package. The command to run the package is installer packages called extremes. In this X E X T R is capital, so that's also case sensitive there. So when I run that command, right, it's going to install. See, it's downloading stuff. Once that is done, your job is not done yet. Go to packages and see whether you have this extreme or not. You have this extreme extreme value analysis basically right extreme means extreme value is getting analyzed in short right now if i were to load this either i can run this command called library of extremes or i can put a check mark beside that either way it's going to lo load right within this particular package called extremes you have very uh, many sub packages like elmom um, and distillery car and all that right now here it says package car could not be loaded. That's okay. They, say, they also say that package car was built under version this. So there will be few, you know, um, packages which are preloaded into R. Not sure why it's not um, taking that. That's okay. Let us now run this command and see QQ plot. Now it's not taking this also because this might be because, you know, uh, your car package is not getting installed. So let me run this once again and see whether the issue is going to get fixed or not. So I'm running this extremes package once again. I'm just checking whether 
car package gets installed properly or not. I think it got installed properly only. Let me load this. All right. So let us try another mechanism. Probably this car package was upgraded recently. It should not happen this way, but anyways, let's try whether this is going to fix or not. Perfect. Perfect. Now let me load this car package. What's going wrong here? RCPP. So let me install that also. RCPP. Yeah, let me install this package there. See, when I installed in this way, right, it automatically took that command there. So in this way, you can also come to know how to, you know, debug the errors that you might encounter as you proceed with your R usage. It's just simple to read those and make sense out of that. Move on. Mm -hmm. RCPP got installed. Let me check RCPP there. Let me check that and let me see whether that's going to load properly. I got loaded properly. Now let me check whether the package called R is going to load successfully or not. Ah, successfully we have debugged this. RCPP is dependency of car. Yeah. So here we have. So what did we just do now? We have also come up with some kind of bands. Band, right? Now, if the majority of your data points fall within this band, then that means your data follows normal or data follows normal distribution. I wanted to refrain from using the word distribution, but for now that's okay. So if the data is okay, normal, then it would look like that, right? And the uh, majority of the points, if they fall within this, within these bands, then you can claim that the data are normal, everything is fine, kind of, right? So that is this command there. This command here, right, randomly generates a lot of numbers. So you are telling this that, hey, randomly generate 599 points, data points, whose mean is 15 and standard deviation is 3. And assign those random numbers to this variable called x1. So let me run that command. So look at that in global variables. Uh, x1 now has numbers. How many numbers? 599 numbers, which are randomly generated. And if I take the average of all these numbers, it would be 15. If I look into the standard deviation of all these numbers, the value would be 3. Let me generate another set of random variables. Now it's saying that generate 500 random uh, variables, which has a mean of 25 and standard deviation of 5. So here are the 500 numbers which got generated. Random numbers which are normal. Norm stands for normal. 500 random, normal, normally distributed variables. And if I run this command, right, three times of x1 plus four times of x2, I can do that operation, and I can assign it to this variable called y. Ignore this warning, that's okay. It's just saying that, oh, it's gonna be very lengthy and things like that, right? So I'm multiplying this 15.9 by three, and multiplying 20 by four, and I'm summing up these two, I'm getting this value. So all these kind of things are also possible. Now once I generate random numbers and look into my QQ plot, look at that. I just wanted to show on when does your data look normal and when does it not look normal, right? So if I generate numbers randomly and if I do any sort of operation on that, then it's going to be normal. So look at this. Almost all my points are very close to this red line. And also, almost all the points are within this band. The dotted lines, right? Those are my bands. So this is called as normal QQ plot. This will help you understand whether your data follows normal distribution or not. And then we need to discuss about central limit theorem and all that. And if you want to explore more about QQ plot, right? Just put a question mark in QQ plot, you'll learn more about that. Here we go. QQ plot, it's part of your car package. 
you will have a brief explanation of that you will have the code right and um, there will also be argument explanation on what each argument means and brief description and there will also be an example towards the end right so all this is possible is what I'm saying you guys right okay uh, there are a lot of help documents available in an R just because you know humanly it's not possible for you to remember each and every code, each and every syntax and all that. Now going back to our discussion, we know what is mean standard deviation variance, we have discussed about covariance and that. We have looked into the histogram, if I take a log of that histogram it's going to transform the data and show that the data is following some kind of normal distribution there and every time it's not going to do this right if I look into GMAT score it's looking like that if I take a log it's further getting distorted so always taking a log of the value is not going to transform your data to normal sometimes it might even further distort so probably I might try out exponential of this and check whether data is getting transformed to the normal in this way Normal means what? It's symmetrical across the mean, towards the left and right, it looks I like and things like that. So by looking into histogram, I can also find out whether there's a long tail concept. Here there is a long tail concept towards the right direction, which means your skewness value is going to be positive. Here your skewness value is going to be negative. That is skewness, right? And kurdosis means if the kurdosis value is positive, it will be thinner, thinner, and if the kurdosis value is going to be large, it's going to be wider. So this is just to tell you about the data, right, and on how the data is looking like and things. So let us move on further. We have also looked into the box plot. We know that box plot has minimum value, maximum value, first quartile, third quartile, and median. Mean value would not be there in the box plot. It also identifies the outliers. Because mean is influenced by your outliers, right? And because box plot also shows the outliers, it doesn't show you the mean value. Right? Both mean and outliers showing at one go doesn't make sense. Hence, it shows a median value. However, if you want to look into the mean value also, you can use this command called summary of the MBA file. Then we have these are the commands used to calculate mean, variance, standard deviation, skewness, kurosis, and all that. We have generated this chart, QQ plot, normal QQ plot, right? We have looked into uh, how our data was looking for the GMAT variable, right? It wasn't looking normal at all. And again, we have randomly generated some data and check whether that data is following normal distribution or not. And we have we, we now know that it's following a normal distribution here because all the data points are closer to the line and falling within these bands. Here we go. What do you mean by normal distribution? All the while you have been telling normal, normal and all that, right? First of all, tell me what is that normal, <laughs> right? That might be a question. So here we go. Any normal curve, right? First of all, you need to identify how the distribution is going to look like. Is it looking like this, long tail? or does it have a long tail towards the other side or is it symmetrical? You need to find out this because based on the kind of distribution that the data follows, your analysis is going to change. Hey, Sam, uh, Sam has something to say. On kurtosis on your slide, K is capitalized. What do you mean by that? I didn't get you. What do you mean by K is capitalized? All right, here you have the bell curve. It's in a bell shape, right? If you go to a temple, etc., or Christmas bell and things like that, it would appear like this, like a bell curve, right? Here, this particular curve is never going to touch. Sorry, sorry, sorry. All right. This curve is never going to touch the line on either side because it will be minus infinity and plus infinity. Similar to your sky, right? If you look at sky from a far off distance, you feel that it's touching the earth, but it never touches anywhere, right? So that is how it is. It reaches minus infinity and plus infinity there. 
it is symmetrical and centered around the mean if that is a mean right it's symmetrical across and one more interesting thing about your standard normal distribution is that mean is equal to median is equal to mode all three values were look alike all these three values and any normal distribution can be specified using these two parameters if I just mention you that hey mean is so much and standard deviation is so much you can actually find out how the distribution is going to look like and we can write it like this your random variable X is normally distributed approximately with mean mu and variance Sigma square okay just focus on this if my mean is equal to 0 and standard deviation is equal to 1 it's represented using this blue curve if I let my mean remain as is and reduce my standard deviation the width is going to reduce as in this curve if I rem let my mean remain as is and increase the standard deviation to 2 it's gonna look wider right because the variance is increasing and it's represented using this curve if I let my standard deviation remain as is and change my mean uh, to minus 1 it's going to move towards the left direction as in this case because it's negative if I let my standard deviation remain as is and if I change my mean to positive it's gonna move towards your right direction that is what your normal distribution is and I do not, do not intend to explain more because that's part of your Six Sigma and all that. So that is why I'm telling that any normal curve, or any, any of these curves, I can represent using a mean and variance or standard deviation, water bleed. It's very easy for me, right? I can just characterize any curve. If I draw like this or like this or more wider, whatever curve that I want to draw, right? I can draw and I can represent using this, these two simple two parameters mean and standard deviation or variance yeah guys if you have any doubts please ask me otherwise I'll just proceed and what is a Z value we have looked into covariance and correlation right there we have discussed about the Z value I told we need to standardize or normalize the data using Z value and it's equal to this xi minus mu by standard deviation so rather than spend time here let us proceed with this example suppose the GMAT scores are distributed normally with mean mu and standard deviation 29 I want to calculate the probability of any random value is less than or equal to 680 that's my GMAT score how do we calculate that here is step one I first need to calculate so if I draw this curve right this curve is represented using what mean mu is equal to 711 and the standard uh, or variance equal to 29 now I want to know whether the probability of any value any GMAT score is going to be less than 680 where will this number 680 lie towards the left of the mean or right of the mean your friends is it going to lie towards the right of the mean or left of the mean if the mean is equal to 711 here towards the left you all agree that it's gonna lie towards the left because here we have 711 your 680 might lie somewhere here 680 I want to know that what is the probability of I getting a value which is less than 680 and that is this shaded region for that first of all you need to identify your Z value because we want to standardize if you cannot standardize you cannot calculate right so let me standardize if I standardize it using X minus mu by standard deviation I get this value minus 1.06 what is the probability that I get a value which is less than 
minus 1.06. For this, I need to look into Z table. So, hmm? uh, I want to look into the probability that, where did it go? Sorry, here it is. Probability that the Z value is less than minus 1.06. So look into that minus 1.06. Why is it not moving? Okay, let me use a highlighter and show you. Here is minus 1.0606 is somewhere here. It's gonna be 0 0.1446, which is nothing but 14%. Now, why did I standardize? Because if I do not standardize, I cannot use my Z distribution table. My GMAT score can be 680, or it can be 780, or it can be 800, or it can be 500. It can be any value. Instead of GMAT score, if I use, say, work experience of a person, it can be zero, it can be one year, it can be five years, it can be six years, it can be 100 years also. So for these different values, I cannot have any table which is uh, formalized or standardized in this way. Hence, I need to standardize. Once it's standardized, right, no matter whether I have GMAT score or work experience or heights of people or weights of people or the salaries drawn, whatever value I look into, if I standardize, it will come to these kind of values, right, normal values. It will take one of these values. And if I have these values, I can quickly calculate what is the probability. And that is the reason I standardize. In mathematics, I need a standard way of doing things. I cannot have a separate distribution for, or a different table for these kind of values, 680, 711 and all that. I cannot have some other uh, table for values which deal with the fuel prices, fuel prices, or the salaries. Doesn't make sense for me to have thousands of such tables. Instead, I'm going to have only one table, which is called a Z distribution table, right? That is nothing but standardizing. If I standardize all these values, whatever units it has, it's going to come to a single unit. That's simple, right? And here, if I want to calculate the Z value between two values, right? For example, I want to calculate what is the probability that this X value lies between 697 and 740. How do I calculate? Let me draw this. We know for a fact that the mean is equal to 711, right? 740 would fall somewhere here. So I need to calculate the probability that a value is less than 740. I will calculate that. And also I'm going to calculate another thing which is uh, sorry, sorry about that. So here is my mean of 711 and 740 would be somewhere here. I want to find out the probability that X value is less than 740 there. And also, I'm going to calculate the probability of X value, which is less than 799. If I subtract your probability of 740 from probability of 697, I'll be left out with what region? The middlemost region here. And this middle region is what I want because I want X greater than or equal to um, this 697 and X value less than or equal to 740. Simple, I calculate this, that, subtract both. That's gonna be a different lengthy exercise, right? For that, I need to uh, show you on how we calculate probability density function. If I were to calculate the normal distributed, uh, distribution calculations. And if I want to know 95% of, of all possible sample means, whether they lie between 1.96 standard deviation of the population mean, if you're confused, do not worry. So what they are asking us to calculate here is that if I draw this kind of a curve, and if I look into 95% of the confidence, right, from one side of the mean till here, the Z value corresponding to 95 percentage would be 1.96 Z value and the Z value towards the other side would be minus 
And if we want to construct a confidence interval, uh, for example, what is the probability that my average sales is going to lie between $1 million and $2 million, right? What is the probability that the heights of the people would vary from 5 feet to 6 feet? If I were to make such kind of a statement, so we have this hypothesis testing, right? And uh, what is hypothesis testing? If I have any decision that I want to take, for example, should I open a new store or not? If you want to open a new store, you want to take an action, right? That is called as alternate hypothesis, take action. If you do not want to open a store, you take no action. So take action and don't take any action. These are the two hypotheses which I want to frame. Right, if I ask you the simple question on should I open a new store, your null hypothesis will say do not open new store, so take no action. Your alternate hypothesis says open the new store, open the store, so take action. Any, 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 any problem that we are going to deal with from here on, right, we first compose null and alternate hypothesis and try to test it statistically. So any, any decision that I want to take, for example, I require a person comes to you, a project manager comes to you and says, hey, I require additional 400 person hours. If a person comes to you and says, I want additional 400 person hours, you do not want to just believe that person on the face value, right? Instead, you want to statistically prove whether this is right or wrong. So you write down your null and alternate hypothesis. You say, hey, my null hypothesis says that I don't want to take any action. When will I take no action? If I feel that on an average, the number of person I was required is less than or equal to 400, then I'm not going to hire any new people. The project manager who has come to me asking for additional 400 person hours, I'll say, no, I'm not going to give you because in reality, you require less than 400 person hours. But in reality, if you can prove that the number of person hours required is greater than 400, then you're going to say, hey, I need to hire new people. I need to take an action. Whenever you take an action, it is called as alternate hypothesis. Whenever you do not take an action, it is called as null hypothesis. I'm just introducing you to the basics here. That's it. Do not worry if you do not still understand. Think about your court. Whenever you do a crime, you'll be presented before the judge in the court, right? So if the judge really, uh, or in reality, if you committed a murder, and if the judge is going to put you behind bar, that means the judge has taken a right decision. You have committed a murder in reality, and the judge is punishing you. That's a right decision. If you're innocent in reality, and if the judge is releasing you scot-free, that is also a correct decision. But if you're innocent and if the judge is putting you behind bars, that is called as type one error. It is also called as alpha error. And there might be another situation wherein you might have committed a murder, but the judge is releasing you scot-free. That is called as type two error or beta error. That is called as type two error or beta error there. Now, look into the simple example here, which is given. You have all days uh, calls. This is a call center data. You have the calls coming in, and you calculate the time taken to resolve each and every call. Call one has taken 3.7 minutes, call to 4.1 minutes, and so on and so forth. And on a daily basis, you take the average and check whether your process is stable or not. And when we, you say that your process is stable, nothing has changed, when the mean value is equal to 4. If the mean value is greater than 4 or less than 4, you feel that, hey, something is going wrong. But should you really worry if the average mean is 4.1, 4.2, 4.3, and there's a small change, do you want really worry? or if there's a small variation towards the other side. If the mean on a particular day is say 3.8 or 3.9, do you really want to worry about the process? 
that my process is varying a lot and things like that? Maybe, may not be, right? But you need to statistically prove this. On when you'll be worried, you have this benchmark which says, on an average, the time taken to resolve the calls in my call center should be four minutes. It should not be greater than that or less than that. Right, so look into this. When will you take no action? When will you take no action? And when will you take an action? You will take no action if your mean is equal to exactly four minutes. If the mean is not equal to four minutes, that means it fits less than or greater than your true mean, uh, then you'll take an action because you feel that the process is not stable or things like that. You feel that or when you when you have taken average of a particular day calls average time taken to resolve the calls on a particular day you get this value as 4.6 now this 4.6 is greater than 4 that means do you feel that the process has changed do you want to take an action yes or no that's a question here now you calculate the z value how do you calculate z value is what x minus mean by standard deviation right now there is a new concept which I'm introducing which is called a standard error standard error standard error is nothing but your standard deviation divided by square root of n so here z value is what x is 4.6 my mean is 4 assume that the standard deviation is given to you as 3 and assume that there are 50 calls which you have recorded. If you calculate the Z value, you'll get 1.41. That's towards the positive sign. The average call duration can also be less than your mean, which is 4. So you need to look into the other side also. If I calculate, it'll be minus 1.41. Now, how am I getting this P value as 0.16? I go back and look into the z distribution here and I try to find out if the z value is one minus 1.41 or what is that yeah minus 1.41 it's minus 1.41 is this value right yeah it's 0 0.0793 it is point zero seven nine three point zero and look into z value if it is greater than one point four one one point four one sorry hey here you go one point four one would be what approximately zero point uh, nine two oh seven so if I add here one point four one point nine two oh seven right so, if I add 0 0.9207, uh, do you know what will happen? It will approximately be 0 0.16. It will be approximately 0 0.16. But what did I write down as my null and alternate hypothesis? I've written down in this way, right? Null hypothesis says take no action. In reality, your mean is approximately four, so take no action. If your alternate hypothesis, uh, your alternate hypothesis says take an action, because mean is not equal to four. But the, if the mean is slightly varying, if it's 4.6, should I really take an action was my question. I cannot be so stringent saying that only if my average call duration is four minutes, I'll take no action and things like that. I cannot be so stringent. So when I've evaluated this statistically, I got the p-value as 0 0.16. Probability, p-value is probability. So for now, remember this slang which says, p high, null fly. That means if p-value is greater than 0 0.05, I'm going to accept null hypothesis, right? If this p-value is less than 0 0.05, you say p-low, null go. That means if the p-value is less than 0 0.05, you're going to reject null hypothesis. If I reject that, I'll go with alternate hypothesis. Right? 
wherein I take an action, I feel that, hey, process has changed and I take an action. Here, since the p-value is greater than 0 0.05, I'm not going to take any action. I'll say it's business as usual, I'm going to take no action, absolutely. All right? Okay, so I'm not asking you that question on is it okay or things like that, right? So we have one small thing which is called as ANOVA, analysis of variance. What is analysis of variance? If you're comparing means of greater than two, right? If you're comparing means of greater than two things, for example, I want to compare the average performance or productivity of different departments of my company. Say there is a chart department, I have finance department, I have sales and marketing department, I have logistics department. If I'm trying to compare the mean productivity of logistics company and HR department and finance department and the marketing department, right? I put down my null hypothesis, which is all these are equal. I can also have an alternate hypothesis, which says at least one mean is different. At least one of these means is different, right? So I simply write down this. And uh, based on this ANOVA, you calculate a p-value. And if this, this p-value is less than 0 0.05, you say p-low, null go, and you go with this alternate statement which says, hey, average performance or productivity of all departments is not the same. So I want to take action. I want to put in some improvements for those departments which are not doing a good job. Or if the p-value is greater than 0 0.05, I say that P high, so null fly, I'm going to accept null hypothesis, which says that the average performance of all the departments is the same. So I need not take any action. Null hypothesis says take no action. Alternate hypothesis says take action. Right? Now, why should the p-value be compared against this alpha value of 0 0.05, where is that 0 0.05 coming from? Normally, your leadership or your management team make this underlying assumption that 95% of the times, I want you to be correct. But you are a human being, you're not a superhuman, you're not a demigod, things like that. Hence, you, your decisions are prone to be wrong. So I'm giving you a 5% chance of actually being wrong. 95% of the times you have to be right. What does that mean? 5% of the times you might be wrong. So this p-value is compared against this 5%, which is 0.05. If the probability of you making a mistake is less than 0 0.05, or if the probability of you making a mistake is less than 5%, only then I'm going to take an action. If the probability of I making a mistake is greater than 5%, I'll not take any action. Uh, I'll not take any action. Because my management has told that, hey, you have to be 95% of the times right. I'm giving you a chance of being wrong only 5% of the times. Will it, will it always be 95 and 5%? No. Sometimes your senior management com can come back to you and say, hey, I want you to be 99% of the times right because we are dealing with the lives of the humans. That in turn means that I'm giving you only 1% chance of being wrong. And it's a, under such circumstance, your alpha value would be 0 0.01. That means if the probability of you making a mistake is less than 1%, only then I'll take an action. I'll do something. 
if the probability of you making a mistake is greater than 1%, then I'll not take any action. That is what your null and alternate hypothesis means. Is this clear, friends? Did you understand hypothesis? Everyone, everyone, please. If you did not understand still, I am willing to repeat this. Sam has understood, Satya has understood. Vishal is not there. Amar, did you understand? Ganapati, did you understand? Right? No one uh, need to be, you know, ashamed in having uh, concepts clarified. So, it's for another six minutes. So, 8.30 to 11.30, it's for three hours. I normally take break after every one hour so uh, I'm sorry I have not taken a lot of break because we have lost at least say 45 minutes or so in just the introduction and things like that setting the context yeah we are almost done right uh, we are almost done you just need to run these commands these commands until now whatever commands we have used is given there you can run these commands at your own leisure and uh, make sense out of that right um, let me give my best shot for the next six minutes here. So there is something called as ANOVA, right? ANOVA, what does that mean? Say I have four different groups or three different groups. I have my HR department, logistics department, and I also have my sales and marketing department. I have the productivity values. I take an average of this. I get one average called as average of HR. I take the average of logistics, I get the average of logistics. I take the average of sales and marketing, I get sales and marketing average. If I pick up any one value from this, say I picked up one value, that one value might not exactly lie on the mean of HR, right? On this average, this average and these points will not be exactly same. Never sales team. Now from this HR department data set, I just plot one data point. This data point will not be exactly on this. There'll be some variance. That variance is called as error, sum of square error. Now, if I take average of all these averages, I'll get a grand average, overall average. This average of HR would not be exactly on this, right? It might be slightly different. That is called as your treatment error. When I divide these two, treatment error and, uh, sorry, sum of um, square treatment and square error, I'm going to get F value. And then the same way you calculate the P value. And if the P value is less than alpha, P low, null go. P high, null fly. My job is done. You, if you also plot this logistics department average, say logistics department average, it will not fly, it will not, be placed exactly on this overall average. It might be slightly different. And that is called as my treatment. And this is called as my error. Now why the why do you divide by R minus one and minus R is all about degrees of freedom and all that? Which I think you need not know to that extent. Simply remember one thing that you use analysis of variance, right? If you want to compare more than two things with each other, more than two departments, more than two countries, right? More than two different um, vehicles or whatever be it, right? You use ANOVA, which is called as analysis of variance. And you write down null alternate hypothesis. Null hypothesis means take no action. Alternate hypothesis means take action. And then you calculate the p-value. I'm sure that ANOVA part, you might not be extremely clear or convinced on the calculations, right? I do not intend to deep dive and further confuse you. Remember that this is called as degrees of freedom. You're dividing it for a reason because otherwise, okay, if the number of data points increase, your error value is going to increase and treatment value is going to increase. If you want to do a deep dive on this, I can share a document around ANOVA. You can go through that and try to do a deep dive around that. Yeah, so there we come to end of the session. Just to recap, we have looked into measures of central tendency, mean, median, mode. We have looked into measures of dispersion, which is 
variance standard deviation and range then we have looked into correlation coefficient values then we have looked into how do uh, how to standardize or normalize something then we have looked into histogram box plot graphical representations we have looked into when do you call a process or some data as following normal distribution right and then we have looked into hypothesis testing and then we have looked into the simple ANOVA so these are the various things which we have discussed over the past three hours I'm going to stop here if you have any doubts whatsoever you can ask me now we are going to stop for the day this recording would be made available on LMS please please go through that once again right so where this predictive modeling applies in real time is what Ganpati says. Yeah, no problem Ganpati, that's a very valid question, right? So the concepts which we have discussed until now, right? Uh, we have just statistically evaluated our decision making, right? If we want to compare the performance of multiple departments or multiple individuals in my team, I simply do ANOVA test and try to find out whether the performance of all the individuals in my team is the same or is any one person in my team having low performance if he has low performance probably I'll put him through some trainings I'll give him some guidance so that he improves upon so rather than being subjective I'm trying to bring in some statistics here so we have discussed only that tomorrow we'll discuss about building prediction models all right, friends, thank you so much for your time. And remember just one thing that all these concepts cannot be learned overnight. So I would request you to go through this again.